So our game was going well up until a couple of weeks ago. We play at one of the players' houses, and his mother began to insist that we let his little brother play, because he's been complaining he wants to all week. The player has privately been informed that the use of his house depends on it. So little brother joins in, halfway through the campaign. To try and learn, he's been reading through his big brother's books, except this is pretty much amounted to looking through splat books for the pretty pictures. He comes to the game and demands to be a demi-lich. We just kind of sit there, unsure what to say. This is a level 9 game and the guy wants to be a demi-lich. Obviously, we tell him no. Cue half an hour of temper tantrum. He even started to cry 20 minutes in. The mother comes and yells at the big brother. Big brother tries to explain the problem and eventually he relents. If he gets to play his second idea, a dragon. Oh god. <sighs> Now see, the other problem is, the DM, he's an enabler. He was actually trying to suggest the kid play a Lich Wizard 4 instead. So when the kid wanted to be a dragon instead, guess what he got? Yep, a dragon. A very young brass dragon. The first thing he does is declare that he is party leader. When someone disagrees, he declares, I pin him to the ground and breathe fire on his balls. <laughs> <laughs> His big brother tries to change his mind, but no. I am a big majestic dragon. I should be ruling the lesser races. You're all human, so I'm the leader. Ten minutes of crying later, we decide to play along. It's not so bad, the kid wants to carry on with the GM's story. So he can come out of it the Mary Sue leader, but whatever. He's not saying, let's ditch this dungeon or anything, so we're cool. Until we get a message from the local king, that is. The princess has been kidnapped by a dragon. He wants us to help, blah blah blah. It's actually quite a good story, but also really irrelevant. The kid immediately assumes that A. He's the dragon in question. B. Asking for a ransom of 1 million gold pieces while in the king's court is a clever idea. He'd watched Austin Powers the night before, so when I say B, I mean yelling ONE MILLION DOLLARS! <laughs> Jamming his index finger in his mouth because he's a fucking retard <laughs> and giggling like a schoolgirl. At this point, everyone is holding their head in their hands. Our poor, poor DM is trying to hide behind his screen. What? The kid asks. Eventually, the DM comes to our rescue and pulls a solution out of his ass. The kid did do it, but another dragon stole the princess while they were going to see the king. Everyone saw that dragon. So everyone thinks the kid is joking and have a good laugh, then sends us on our way. Kid only pites a little. He wants his princess back. We manage to get to the dragon's lair and defeat it without too much hassle. The kid likes to go, are you sure? And demands his AC and the dragon starts to be checked every time he gets a hit. And there the princess is, tied to an altar. Everyone's preparing to wrap up. We're all 18 to 20. But now that the kid is playing, we have to stop before his 9pm bedtime. When the kid, looking through a DMG he swiped from his big brother, asks, how much XP is he worth? Hell no. The DM makes a show of looking at his notes and decides to go for a cop out, saying she's not worth anything but he'll get quest XP for returning her. So the kid calms down, at least for now. We take the princess and return, and the kid demands his one million gold pieces. The big brother finally loses his temper. Unfortunately, that just means turning to the kid and saying, don't be a retard, you can't do that. Fine, the kid says, giggling. I shit in her chest. <laughs> if the Demi Lich got an awkward silence before, this was a kind of anti sound that nulled any noises in the room. Nobody believes, nobody wants to believe that he just said that. In the pause, he adds, and then I rape her. Oh god. And finally, breaking point is reached. See, on the other side of the kid is Dave. We don't have any assholes in the group, but if we did, it would be Dave. If he doesn't know a rule from memory, he can find it in a stack of books we own in under a minute. He doesn't have much tolerance for faggotory, but he's a nice guy and prefers quiet role playing. He's a quiet guy, slow to anger, although even he has needed to be talked into staying by the DM. At this point, Dave loses his temper. I cast Phantasmal Killer. What? No, you... Enabling DM is caught off by Dave slamming the dice cup in front of the kid. DC 25, he says. The kid rolls. Even before the dice stops moving, 
He's reaching out to stop it and saying, I rolled a 30. Dave's hand slams down over the dice, nearly hitting the kid. He leaps back into his chair. Dave lifts his hand. It's a 10. See? 30, the kid says. Before the kid can react, Dave snatches his character sheet and looks over it. Your will save is plus 7, he says. But I have special immunity to... Dave rips up the sheet. The kid starts to cry and launches an attack on Dave. Dave responds by grabbing the kid by the hair and dragging him off. The others follow, partly to try and stop him but mostly to watch. Everyone knows that sooner or later the kid's screaming is going to attract the mother. Dave smartly wrestles the kid and gets a grip on his arm instead beforehand, but he doesn't let go. What is the meaning of this? What are you doing? The angry mother rushes over to console her bawing kid. Pussy DM steps forward. I'm sorry ma'am, we won't do it again. He stole my cigarettes. Dave suddenly said. If you hadn't seen what happened before, you'd think Dave was mad over this. We nod, because we know the truth. Dave has this odd nervous habit. His left leg starts to jitter and shake when he's angry. And right now, he's leaning on Big Brother for support. Nobody dares fuck with this lie. What? The mother finds this hard to believe, of course. The kid is quick to react to, pointing to Dave by screaming, Liar! Liar! Check his pockets! Dave says simply. Guess what Dave managed to cram into the kid's pockets while he was shifting his grip. And now, the kid is still grounded. He's never going to play D&D with us again. Unfortunately, we're out of our only good gaming spot. The mother thinks it's our fault for being such bad influences on him and doesn't want us back. And Big Brother guesses it will take at least six months to get her on her good side. We've been looking for somewhere nice. We've tried a player's bedroom, Crammed into a one-person room with a single chair didn't work. Dave's backyard? It started raining. And are currently holed up in his garage slash basement. It's not a good place to play unless you want to LARP Stingpunk Noir or something. But it's something. And we've made a new house rule. Dave never has to pay for snacks again for a year. Well, this will require setup to make understandable. But rods of gust wind can only be used with perform checks. So my usual group says they would like to try something, just a one-off, and they would buy dinner for me if I did. I was like, okay, but they better be bonus wings. So 15th level 3.5 game, no actual settings, just generic fantasy time with several skilled craft wizard. So players have characters already made. This makes me pleased as I don't have to wait 3 hours. I go over the sheets. Bard? Bard again? Warrior? Wizard? Okay, weird party. Look at the names. Bard 1, Rogerin, Dietrich. Bard 2, Pytro, Dietrichfin. Warrior, Kiefer, Moonfallen. And the wizard, Jonathan Entcaller. I was like, interesting names, guys. You seem like you put some work into this. Stats looked good. All of them had some points in charisma, though not sure who the face was, since they were all human. Anyway, I got things rolling. Before I even get a chance to exposition, players go... Can we get some magical items crafted while we're here? And you do your exposition stuff while we investigate while waiting? As I'm all like, sure, I know this isn't going to end well. So Bard 2 says he simply wants an enchanted lyre that helps him with his perform checks and is glamoured to look like whatever he wants and has ghost sound so it can play sounds that aren't really what you'd expect from a lyre. I was like, okay, sounds cool. Wizard says he wants some wondrous items since we don't really have a rogue. He wanted to be kind of sneaky and have things that would allow him to make distractions and stuff. So small little sticks that would do different things, like ghost sounds, dancing lights, colour spray, light, pressed agitation. When he got them back, he painted some white and some black to help differentiate so he wouldn't forget which was which because he had like 30 of them. Warrior wanted three shields of different sizes for different situations, all enchanted with thundering. I house rule that you can't put elemental weapon enchants on shields so you can do the d6 of said element on a shield bash. I let him have them so he got his large shield, small shield and buckler all similarly enchanted. I was like okay whatever. Finally Bard1 says he wants a rod of gust wind but he wants it to be not max level. He wants to be able to adjust it like with the perform check for different levels of wind. I decided that he could do worse things to me with that money, so I let it fly. So on with the adventure. 
I tell them that the party is located in a desert city that has been attacked by a vicious desert orc tribe that has been seen camping out near the base of Plateau. Kinda hard to miss, because there is a massive canvas tarpaulin on a huge strut set out from the cliff wall so that the orcs don't sit in direct sunlight all day, in preparation for their night raids. The party decides that they'll go and investigate, as it gets dark so they can see the big shots organising the night raids and make a plan to take them out. Anyway, the party picks up their stuff, buys a couple of mundane bits of equipment like some 10 foot poles, rope, adventure stuff, then head out. They get to the place easily visible by the large number of campfires at dusk. The party all drinks potions of invisibility and silence after casting telepathic bond, and they sneak into the camp. They make their way to what appears to be a banquet platform, not used for that night yet, and decided to set up there in order to ambush the obviously important orcs who would dine above everyone else. The warrior takes up position closest to the cliff wall at the back and sets out his shields and pulls out his nunchucks. He took the proficiency and waits. The wizard pulls out his little sticks and uses two dial rods to connect them together so he can easily hit multiple sticks at the same time or in rapid succession in specific patterns. Bard 1 whips out his lyre and gets ready to play some music. And this is where it all clicked. Bar 2 pulled out his rods of gust wind, having finally come up with the command word for it. Pulls the rod near his mouth, leans back so the other end is looking out over the camp and shouts, Yeah! Gets a perform check with a natural 20 in the upper 40s. As the warrior begins to beat his shields, the wizard plays his keyboard and Bard 1 lets out a riff from the Who's Who Are You? I decided that based on the perform checks and bonuses from the synchronized singing slash playing and clever setup that the music was so awesome and the gust of wind is so powerful, it literally blew the minds of half the orcs there. The other half got blown away in a hurricane force winds, while the wizard played a dazzling light show and the warrior stunned slash deafened any orcs that rushed the stage with blasts from his shield slash drums. Okay, we're party. Look at the names. Bard 1. Roger and Dietrich, Bard 2, Pytro de Townfin, Warrior Kiefer Moonfallen, and the wizard Jonathan and Collar. It became clear that what their names were, Bard 1, Roger Daltrey, Bard 2, Pete Townsend, Warrior Keith Moon, and the wizard John Enswistle. All I could do was applaud them and eat the delicious pizza they brought for me for dinner, as they went around performing songs across the plains.